InFi, episode 24. Welcome to InFi, the future of finance, hosted by American economist and author, Dr. Robert Murphy. Each week, tune in for dynamic discussions with business pioneers about emerging trends in finance, life insurance, asset management, technology, and more. Now, let's talk the future of finance. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the InFi podcast. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Bob Ejidama, who is the VP of Capital Markets for INX. And to explain what INX is, let me go ahead and read you from their website. This is from the CEO. My vision of shaping capital markets and their evolution from the traditional world to a digital economy is coming to life. The INX token was the first and significant milestone, the first SEC registered security token to IPO on the blockchain. INX.1, O-N-E, is another important step in our extraordinary journey, presenting the world's first fully regulated platform that merges investing and trading in security tokens, cryptocurrencies, and capital raise services all in one place. INX provides a safe and secure path for responsible trading on multiple asset classes. Okay, and so I'm going to have Bob expand upon that, but I just wanted to give you a quick flash into what it is that we're going to be talking about. As you can imagine, we're not merely going to talk about INX per se, but the conversation expands to include just all kinds of events happening around the world, what the future of this environment looks like, possible regulations coming down the pike, that sort of thing. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Bob Ejidama. Bob, welcome to the InFi podcast. Thank you very much. Glad you to be here. I'm glad to have someone else with a familiar name. Uh, I don't right. know, does this, does this happen to you where every syllable, at least in the English language, sounds like Bob? Like if you're in an airport or so, it seems like everyone's saying you're turning around. And, and you're just looking around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I get, okay. it with, well, I get it with Paul a lot. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. I suppose I should ask everybody because maybe it's just people are narcissists that we all think, every, you know what I mean? It's not Bob, it's just everybody. But I think, no, I really do think there's something about our name that really sounds like every other syllable. So... Can you tell us, uh, I would have already alluded to it a bit in the beginning, but of course, uh, you're here in your capacity with INX. So can you just tell us a background about what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. So INX is a provider of digital assets, listing and trading solutions. The firm was uh, registered or incorporated in 2018. This was in the wake of the ICO bubble back then when people, companies, DAOs, Anonymous people were just raising millions of dollars on the back of a white paper. And the founder of INX approached the United States SEC with the uh, vision of being able to create a capital raising platform, leveraging blockchain technology, but it would offer investors the same tried and tested protections that you know you would expect and that the SEC has uh, has put in place for years. And the this approach was basically defined through an IPO, an F1 prospectus, whereby INX was aiming to raise capital to build a trading ecosystem, a listing ecosystem, capital raising, underpinned by blockchain technology fully regulated, fully licensed, and basically usher in a new era of regulated digital assets. So we were successful in actually getting that approval from the United States SEC. It wasn't without toil. It was about sure. it's just, just under three years of back and forth, probably over a million dollars and lots of blood, sweat, and tears. But effectively, the INX F1 prospectus became approved, and it was the first ever blockchain IPO in United States history. It was a great success. We raised $84 million or thereabouts from mm -hmm. 7,200 retail investors in 65 countries around the world. It basically proved the model, right? You can do a regulated ICO, we call it a security token offering, and raise capital from investors all over the world. First, you went to United States SEC regulation. Um, so we then, uh, you know, armed with those funds, we then acquired licenses. So INX is a broker dealer. 
we are licensed to run an ATS, which is a trading platform for digital for uh, digital securities. Hey, hey, Bob, can I stop you for a second? I, this is basic stuff for you, I know, but I just want to make sure we're not losing the audience. So that the IC has been has sometimes done an ICO, your security token offering. There, you were giving digital tokens that were claims to equity ownership in INX itself. So the beauty about security tokens is they can represent equity, but they can also represent things like revenue streams or profit share. Sure. So in the INX case, our token is represents a 40% share of future profits. So if you think about that, it's basically a non-dilutive way of raising capital where you're not giving away equity. You're basically bringing in working capital with the view to then pay out a share of revenue or profits to your investors. So that's what the INX token entails. But we could easily have configured it to be an equity token or have other rights. And not just financial rights, you could have utility benefits as well for holding a token like that. Okay, so sorry, I interrupted you. And then you were saying that once you raise that capital and then you the things you got licenses. Guess, and you were- yeah, and we basically went, you know, we acquired a couple of businesses, a broker dealer with the ATS. We acquired a transfer agent. We also engaged all of the states and jurisdictions in the USA to, to acquire money transmitter licenses. We literally just received Nevada about a week or two ago. So we now have, I think, 49 money transmitter licenses, which is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. And so INX effectively has become one of a very small number of firms, we're talking less than 10, that are licensed in the United States to offer both cryptocurrencies trading as well as digital securities and the primary offering platform for raising capital. And what we have done with the technology and with the licensing is actually bridged both cryptocurrencies and security tokens. So for example, you could on-ramp using crypto and have a fiat balance ready to trade security tokens within six to 10 minutes. Can you, uh, forgive me, Bob, but again, (laughs) this is still pioneering stuff. Just can you explain the definitions of those various terms? Just because I think people throw them around, but so what does it mean to say people start with cryptocurrencies and then they get fiat balances and security tokens? Can you just walk through the nomenclature so everyone knows exactly what you mean? Absolutely. So when you talk about cryptocurrencies, and forgive me, because indeed these terms get used very generically, mm-hmm. right? So truly a currency should be something that represents a store of value and a medium of exchange. And so if you look at that definition, cryptocurrencies would be things like Bitcoin or Litecoin or you know maybe Zcash, some of the true currencies, as opposed to many other assets that are more utility tokens or or other types of tokens. But Effectively, cryptocurrencies are separate assets from security tokens. Security tokens are effectively, you're taking what is a traditional security, and that could be equity, it could be debt, it could be illiquid assets like, you know, a classic car collection or real estate, and you're wrapping that in a token that lives on the blockchain, or you're fractionalizing that asset into potentially millions or even billions of tokens and they live on on a blockchain and you would then have investors coming in and holding minute percentages of the underlying asset and that's a security token and in our case being a u.s broker dealer we are defining securities on you know based on u.s securities Mm -hmm. okay great so just to pursue some of the the unpack some of the things you mentioned there i think they're I believe it's changing, but there was a perception at some point that, oh yeah, if you if you want to do stuff involving the blockchain, steer clear of the United States because their regulators either don't get it, or if they do get it, they don't like it, and so you're much better off establishing yourself elsewhere in a friendlier jurisdiction. So obviously, you guys didn't follow that conventional wisdom. Yeah. So can you speak to that? Absolutely. I mean. The guys who are voicing these opinions very strongly, obviously, are those who've been operating on licensed exchanges for years and have seen billions of dollars potentially flow through their platforms with little to no regulatory oversight. And now they're saying, well, can we just imprint this business model into the existing fabric of of United States securities? laws. 
And it really just isn't that simple. Now, on INX's, uh, from our point of view, it was easy because we started from scratch. We started from zero. We acquired licensing licenses first, got approvals before we even offered any uh, trading or, or listing solution. So we are just positioned in the sense that we've done this the right way. And you could argue it's difficult for someone like, I don't know, like a Binance or a Coinbase to kind of go and start from scratch again. But the, the bottom line is the SEC does have to kind of come to the table and provide a solution because at the end of the day, this is about investor protections. And there's, well, there's people all over the world or in the United States who are using these platforms and exposing themselves to various levels of risk. And the sooner the SEC kind of gets its uh, act together and creates the very clear you know, regulations for those existing businesses to become compliant, then the better. But having said that, there is available regulatory frameworks for companies to come in and get licensed for cryptocurrency trading, just like we did, as well as for security tokens, and to do it all under FINRA and SEC and state uh, uh, regulator oversight. Okay, great. Another related question, and the, the listeners of the SIT podcast know that I, I bring this up often, but you seem like a, a great person to ask. There is a, a school of thought also that they recoil against real-world assets being backed up by digital tokens. And their, their point is, no, the blockchain, like Bitcoin is amazing. It's you know one of the greatest. There's fire and then Bitcoin <laughs> in their mind in terms of human inventions. And that's what's beautiful. It, it, Bitcoin's not a claim on anything. It just It is what it is. One Bitcoin mm-hmm. is one Bitcoin, you know, is the mantra. And then, you know, when I talk to these people about, okay, but, you know, part of what we're doing at Infidio is we're taking life insurance and tokenizing it and putting it on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. And they think I'm either a con man or an idiot because they say, no, th- yeah. th- it defeats the whole, but the point of, of the blockchain is it's its own thing. It lives in its own dimension. And if once you need like real world assets where there's physical things in the material world that courts have to be involved in, but then you lose yeah. the trustlessness and so it defeats the purpose. So anyway, can you respond to that sort of objection? Absolutely. I think first of all, all of these objections and resistance or pushback is born out of some really bad things that have happened in the name of you know, blockchain and, and crypto. And these things make you know, mega headlines and we know that people have been hurt, whether it's FTX or Celsius or Voyager or Terra Luna, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Like it's truly amazing how many rock pulls and how many collapses there have been. And so it is, uh, uh, it's understandable, right? That people just recoil at anything crypto coming close to what has been a traditional financial uh, asset. The bottom line is the underlying technology is what we really should appreciate as the enabler, as the transformational you know, element in the future of finance. And that's the blockchain. And that's that whole trustless, immutable record that is transparent and that could really bring about cost savings, disintermediation, all kinds of benefits that we could go into. And for the large financial firms, the traditional financial players, without a shadow of a doubt, they are not recoiling. They are very quietly and focused They have very focused teams looking at how they will use blockchain technology to reduce costs significantly, speed up settlement, disintermediate, and so on and so forth. So one way or the other, blockchain will be transformational. However, there will continue to be this conversation until such a time where it is evidenced that blockchain is now being used across traditional financial verticals, and then it will become ubiquitous. It will just become this thing that sits behind the scenes and no one will actually talk about that this is all blockchain power. I think this is just the natural evolution of technological change and how it affects business and people's lives and and the global economy. Yeah, so thank you. So let let me come back again just to to clarify what the objection is. So what everything is great. And some of the things you mentioned are relevant here and and here because again I'm, I know what we're doing makes sense but it's when some of these people are coming at me from left field it takes me a minute to think through wait a minute what? and so 
you're right. There's one group of people with the FTX and all that stuff. Uh, you know, going back in the day, the Mount Gox and everything. Just yeah. think, no, this is crazy. You're playing with fire. This newfangled. If they broke, don't fix it. But I'm talking about people that they're so into Bitcoin, they think that's the application for blockchain. And so, for example, I think where they're coming from is something like this. And I'm not trying to stump you. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think through this with you because to understand how to answer these people. It's something like, well, if you say I, I own, you know, these Satoshis and then I transfer it by using my private key and it gets transferred to someone else to say, well, how do we know? How can we trust that as well? Because the net to the, the very definition, what we mean by saying you control those Satoshis is the miners all agree that's an, it's been added to the chain. You know, that block's been added to the chain, blah, blah, blah. But if I say this digital token is a one one thousandth ownership stake in that piece of real estate in Phoenix, Arizona. Yes. There, it's not as obvious that, yeah, the blockchain might say it, but if the local authority, you know, if I go to stay in my apartment and someone can call the cops and the local sure. title says somebody else owns it, I don't care yes. what, what your computer says. Well, you know, I don't care. So you I see still, the, yeah. yeah. I, I, I get that. I mean, bottom line is this is why you have regulation across various mm -hmm. industries, right? Whether it's uh, in healthcare or in financial markets. And when people fall foul of these laws, then potentially there's jail time and there's significant damage. The bottom line is before Bitcoin, before crypto, there were many of these risks existed, right? There were private raises, private offerings where you would be investing as an early stage investor in a business that might be located halfway across the world. And the bottom line would be that you are doing it pursuant to certain securities laws, whether it's those in, in the nation that you live in or the jurisdiction where the investment happens. And so if you, if you look on INX and some of the companies that are raising capital today, we're following strict rules, right? They have a prospectus, they have subscription agreements, they have risk disclosures, that we carry out very detailed due diligence on these firms and then you know, make their offerings available to investors that we are equally vetting and doing KYC on. And we're not just dealing with anonymous wallets here, right? We're dealing with KYC individuals that have linked a digital wallet to their profiles. So you're taking the technology that could be disruptive or transformational, however you want to describe it, but you're layering it on top of existing regulatory frameworks. Mm -hmm. And so some of those arguments are unfounded in, in that sense. Okay, great. Yeah, and you, I mean, and some of what you said fit right in, like, for example, just the settlement time. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the way it is right now, if I've said this before, I apologize to the Infi listeners, they've heard me use this, but it still blows my mind that I, if I have a bit, you know, I have a business checking account and a personal one. And so if I need to move money, you know, I pay myself from, you know, my boss is a jerk. It, it's me. Um, if I, if I write a check from my company to pay myself and I move and I go to the ATM and I do a thing and, and I have to do a paper check because the limits for the, you know, the, I, I got to go and do it because the limits are different. And one time I made the mistake, I wrote the check too big and then it locked it up for 10 days, 10 business right. days. Before mm -hmm. it would be, you know what I mean? And it was a check from me to, you know, like in other words, there yeah. was like nine years of history that checks from this writer are good. And yet, yeah. so yeah. just little things like that, or, you know, it's just a given that, oh yeah, financial stuff's closed during the weekday, weekends. Whereas with blockchain, there, you know, so anyway, just little, I mean, at the very least, besides all the other issues you're bringing up in terms of, well, what's the value add of adding blockchain if it's not Correct. purely just living in the digital zeros and ones of like, like Bitcoin would be? Absolutely. I mean, it's again, I think traditional finance is going to pick and choose which of these technological advancements that they want to apply to their existing models. And they'll do that over time. I mean, I was at a digital assets event back in, in November in London. It was uh, attended by traditional financial players. So you're talking Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, City, and so on. And in some cases, there wasn't actually a desire for a T for instant settlement with instant finality or with finality of settlement. There was the ability, the, the thinking was we will have the ability to do that, but we can basically add a buffer. And while we're no longer talk, talking T plus two, there's still flexibility in how the technology will get used. We have already bridged some of these 
or solves for some of these problems. So for example, on INXs ATS, when trading secondary on the secondary market, we are actually able to settle fiat and crypto legs of trans, uh, uh, sorry, digital legs of a transaction on the weekend. 24 mm-hmm. 7, 365 days a, a year with a banking partner using their technology, API and, and, and a ledger system. So it's going to come slowly and gradually, but it's not going to be overnight. In is the reason for them wanting the buffer is just to help combat fraud that in case something goes through that shouldn't, they want a chance to catch it? There's th- That could be one reason. Um, mm-hmm. Another reason could simply be existing risk controls that potentially they just can't visualize the fact that you could just completely eliminate an entire risk mm-hmm. department, right? You know what I mean? Like overnight, right. you know, oh, right. we don't need that risk team anymore. We don't need that software anymore. Some of this stuff is just human. You're dealing with a lot of senior guys or girls in these positions who have just done things in a certain way and are also kind of of that old school way of working. And so this kind of notion that you could just overnight make these huge transformational steps is just in itself, it's risky, I think, you know, from a human right, kind of right, story. Right. Point. And so I think it's just going to be gradual. And you're also going to see Basically, we have this whole generational transfer of wealth that's happening right now with the baby boomers, and that's also translating into the the demographics and the age groups of the people who are now making the decisions at the financial companies and so on. And I think we'll see an acceleration, but we're still in those early years where it's natural that there's going to be friction, pushback. And like I said, all of those horrible stories that happen in crypto, you know, haven't helped. Right, right. It is funny that there's, um, I'm, I'll try to put this in words, you know, but I think there's a certain sense of that, yeah, like, like, like let's say the stock market, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, and there's a certain comfort in knowing that, no, when, it, when the markets close on Friday afternoon, then we get a break. And, you know, and it doesn't matter what happens, with, you know, if a bomb goes off in you know, <laughs> Iran yeah. or something, it's not until Monday morning, the opening bell, where we know what happened. And so, like, yeah. the idea of it, what if it's just open 24-7 and you can see, it, like, it's almost scary to people. Absolutely. But then when you peel back the layers and you, you know, kind of figure out why is it this way? Well, because humans and, and even machines needed breaks, needed maintenance, yeah. needed rest. And so it's almost a question of, well, why not? Why wouldn't you have 24 by 7 if right. you could and having to wait between Friday and Monday when bombshell news about your investments have now oh. become public and you're a small retail investor on a Charles Schwab system and you're at your last in the queue on Monday morning when, right. the, orders, when the orders go into the exchange, right? But then they're already queued there. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely this whole like democratization and the average... Joe should have the same financial capabilities and as all of the established players. That's a bit of a romantic kind of thought, but we will definitely see a little bit of see that gap closing just by virtue of some of these uh, technologies. On INX, for example, and when we talk about real world assets being tokenized, well, if no. you take a private company that's doing a raise, five, 10, 15 million dollars to, to start their business and are going with the security token offering route to retail and accredited investors in certain jurisdictions, you suddenly have the same game that has been played exclusively by VCs over the last decades and and the large financial players is now being played by retail, by average people around the world. And that's great, although on, on the flip side, there's also an educational aspect that has to come with it because retail doesn't understand these types of investments the same way as those, uh, those institutions that have been doing that for years. So whether you have the technology and you're bridging these gaps into these, you know, doing the democratization is one thing, but being able to support through education and basically carrying along these retail investors and helping them understand the opportunity, both are required. The technology alone isn't enough. 
we as pioneers in the space have a responsibility to make sure that we're educating and we're breaking down these opportunities and these seismic changes in capital markets in a way that, you know, retail and this new class of investor can understand. Mm. Do you feel a certain, I don't know, responsibility that, hey, you're a pioneer in this area. And like you mentioned, there's a lot of other bad actors, either through incompetence or uh, yes. malice. The, the giving certain things a bad name. So it is really up to us to really be above board so that we can show, hey, this is a viable approach. Absolutely, Bob. You have no idea. I mean, first of all, if when you do things the right way and you play by the book, effectively, you're kind of work, walking a, a narrow path, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that slows you down in, in some degree. Where you then see all these other players just doing stuff. Without And you know there is no way they have the regulatory approvals or the oversights or things like that. And then the news breaks months, years later, and you're like, you know, we, could have, we saw that one coming. It really has taken, has been damaging for the space. But the more responsibility then rests on our shoulders to tell our story as to how you should be doing this, how it can be done, and how it has, how we have been doing so absolutely, we definitely, I mean, we, we wrote a book in two years or ago or so, it's called The INX Way, mm -hmm. where we talk through all of the various opportunities that exist in the tokenization space. We put out a press release sometime last year about things like how we do custody and how we do very clearly segregated custody of customer funds from corporate funds and things like that. All of the things that have gone wrong out there. Mm. So it's definitely a... Uh, responsibility that sits on our shoulders to prove that you can do capital markets and, and crypto and digital assets and security tokens all by the book and kind of draw a line and say there is the bad way of doing stuff to, the, and witness through the stories that we've seen. And then there's the INX way, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just to circle back, you mentioned the democratization. So like you think of something like transportation back in Medieval times, if the king wanted to go somewhere, he'd get his you know, horses and his retinue and it would go, but whereas the peasants were walking. And then is now it? that there's automobiles, sure, uh, somebody rich is going to drive a much nicer car than somebody who is just a you know, blue collar worker. But the difference between the rich person's method of transportation and the poor person's is much smaller now than it was in the year 1500. And so likewise, are you, you know, because do you think there's a similar thing here where these new technologies are going to empower? So, so yes, some, some, the head, yeah. head of a multinational corporation is always going to have an edge. But is the, is the smaller retail investor now, or does this help them gain somewhat in the grant book relatively? Absolutely. So, I mean, think of an example here. Let's take Switzerland, for example. Right? Switzerland put out blockchain legislation uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the things that they've put out in their regulation is that private, privately held companies are able to tokenize their shares and make those available directly on their website to retail investors. And that's huge. That's significant, right? The fact that up until that point, how would a Swiss retail average Joe go about investing in an exciting, let's say, an AI startup? Mm -hmm. Right, where everyone's clamoring for getting on the AI train. And now you could go to any of the AI startups in Switzerland that have chosen to tokenize their shares and make those available and invest the exact same way as private equity and, and others would and VCs would traditionally have invested in. So that's a very good example of how this is empowering, well, closing that gap as you described. But then again, there's two things there, right? There's the technology that makes it possible, but there's also the regulation. So you have to have the regulator understanding the need to empower and, and create the democratization. And that's important, right? It's one thing to say, we're just here to kind of protect investors. It's another thing to say, we're here to create better access to mm -hmm. financial markets for the average investor. And that's, that's important. That's an important distinction. Well, it's funny. He there always has been this tension, at least to my mind, like in the whole idea of an accredited investor. In other words, it's like, oh, we've got these, there's these types of investments and funds and blah, blah, blah. 
the rich people are allowed to get into. And so why do they want to get into there? Well, because obviously yeah. they must be pretty good investments if that's where the rich people want to put. But we don't let the poor people get into there because, oh no, it's, this isn't for you. <laughs> it's, I know, there is I a know. sense in which it's like you know, an old boys club. But on the other hand, you know, I, I get the flip yes. side is to say, well, these things are speculative, maybe, and they're risky. And so it's, there's a difference between yes. putting your money in some private equity well, firm versus uh, you know, just a blue chip stock. Yeah, I, I don't want to comment on, you know, the whole kind of echelons of, you know. Right, right, get, right. But what I will say is, in a, and again, there's an example You, you could just say they're all doing a fabulous job at the regulatory, you know. Just. <laughs> well, I would say during the Obama administration, mm -hmm. the Jobs Act was passed. And in fact, mm -hmm. the father of the Jobs Act, David Wheel, is the chairman of the INX Board of Directors. And when you look at the Jobs Act, it basically translates to these regulated ways for companies to raise capital or for people to invest. So for example, you have the IPO, F1 or S1, which is the creme de la creme of capital raising. Mm -hmm. And then you have lower barriers to entry called these fighting exemptions like a reg, reg, regulation S, regulation D, where companies can raise capital, say under regulation S, from any retail investor anywhere around the world. And so... That's another good example of an administration putting in a, a structured way so that investors, so just not, a, not just accredited investors are able to participate should the company doing the, the issuance choose to. So they could do a Reg A, a Regulation A offering, whereby they would be able to uh, raise from any United States investor, regardless of being accredited or not. Okay. Um, so you... You're based in Cyprus, right? Correct. I'm based out here in the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, were you out there uh, you know, back when the banking crisis happened? No. I, so I was based in London for, you know, I did most of the 20 years of my traditional finance background was based out of London and New York. I worked for, you know, large inter-dealer brokers and mostly dealing with institutional clients. In fact, in 2008, I was literally on the cold face of global foreign exchange when it all went down and when Lehman Brothers collapsed. We were there until four in the morning, kind of pulling credit from various counterparties. It was pretty crazy. So yeah, it's been interesting kind of seeing the transformation and seeing what was the focus of financial markets as a whole, technological tran transformation, high-speed, high-frequency trading, Black box algorithmic trading was the thing then. And then now suddenly you have this whole new asset class and it's crypto and it's not regulated and you have a lot of existing players wanting to have a slice of that pie and somehow figuring ways to do it offshore or sitting back and waiting for the ETF. It truly has been uh, you a know, very interesting last 20 years. Well, the reason I wanted to ask was, at least in certain circles that I'm in, you know, Cyprus was a good example of to say, this is what can happen. Like the banks will just shut. Because in, in the United States, at least there's a, a presumption that, hey, if your money is in the bank, it's pretty safe. And that right. we were You're trying to show. Haircut, the 2013 haircut here in Cyprus. So th th that, but also the, the shutdown, the holiday where people just couldn't get their money at all. And then you're mm -hmm. right, like some certain people, yeah, they called it bail in instead of a bailout. Yes, yes. And yes. So, so anyway, that was always like a poster child for, I guess, some people that I know that where they were recommending other asset classes and saying, don't yes. think because your money is in a regular commercial bank. And even if the FDIC backs it, anyway. So yeah, I was wondering- yeah, there's various, various structural risks to uh, you know, or, or risks that affect your money, whether the money sits in the bank, but now there's hyperinflation and because you're right. in Argentina or you're in you know, some of these other countries that have seen really poor performance of their currency recently. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a whole different way. We look at quantitative tightening or easing or the Fed printing you know, trillions of dollars. There's different ways to look at how your, your money could be at risk. You know, and this is kind of where the crypto guys come from, which is like, well, if we just do crypto, then it's never going to happen again. Like, everyone's going to be able to have absolute freedom and control over their funds. Yes and no, right? So in places like Argentina, if you could hold your pesos in stablecoin, USDC or, or Tether, that's great. But then again, that's not so straightforward over there. So right. yeah, truly exciting times and, you know, really, really curious to see how this is going to play out right over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and, and, and what you're doing is helping and so sort of you're giving people more options, more flexibility. So you're right, each particular place you could park your wealth, there's pros and cons. And just like giving more flexibility, you know, presumably people will be able to weather the storms yes. more nimbly. Correct. I mean, like when I look at what we've achieved, a, a, apart from the technology and the licensing, but just looking at the solutions themselves, because we really should talk about the solutions and less the technology, is the fact that today on INX, you have companies raising capital. One of them, for example, is a Chinese logistics and, and trucking company. And they are cash flow positive and they've paid dividends out to their investors twice. And these investors are spread out across 85 countries. Like there's people who would never have had the opportunity to invest in a startup in China, in one of the very exciting industries in that space, which is logistics and freight. So we are really kind of breaking these barriers and, and it's all about getting this message out there now. And this is why we're grateful to, to podcasts like, the, like these is really to help people understand that there is like, try to shut up the noise, try to filter the crypto story. Like, uh -huh. you know, we've come from 2008 when the technology was born and we've had some turbulent years, but let's really look at where traditional finance is saying that's the use case for crypto. Right. That's the actual use case that we are investing in and we put our names behind, whether that's BlackRock or Citi or Goldman's. And that's where investors should be looking at now. And in fact, I was looking at this uh, survey of fund managers the other day and a huge percentage, I think it was like 73% of fund managers were saying that they were actively working on tokenizing. So there's a lot more traction or there's a lot more intent to mm -hmm. adopt technology than is obvious right now. And I think now that we're out of these last difficult two years and we're heading into, you know, soft landing, Fed will start cutting rates sometime in May, potentially, you know, markets are looking up. I think we're going to see a real acceleration of this tokenization of real world asset story. And it will happen both at the large traditional financial player level, but also at the retail level. And that's where INX is, uh, is operating. Okay, great. Yeah, that's the dovetails with you know the the message, the narrative we've been saying here on the on this show. I think ten years from now, it's going to be obvious, and people are going to think, "Oh yeah, remember back when it this seemed like a newfangled thing, and people weren't sure if it would be like." Remember when people weren't sure if the internet was going to be a big deal? So, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah and we we both, so mm -hmm. there was a ton of it was you know who's AOL and who's Yahoo and Google. Yeah. What are these funny names of these platforms? What and, and it's the same, like what's Cardano and what's Solana and what's, you know, what are these funny names of these, but it's a cycle that's just happening again. And I think, you know, like you said, in 10 years time, we're going to be using applications or wallet features and not talking about the blockchains that sit behind them. Yeah. Potentially. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, I know we both got hard stops here, so we'll end there. So thank you folks. My guest this week has been Bob Edgadama, the VP of Capital Markets at INX. Bob, thanks so much for your time and your insights. Thank you too. This is uh, very, very good to be on your show. Appreciate it. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time. This concludes another episode of InFi, The Future of Finance with Dr. Robert Murphy. The information provided is for educational purposes and does not constitute financial advice. Consult with qualified professionals before making any financial or investment decisions. For more information on the host and for previous episodes, visit infithefutureoffinance.io. Thanks for listening.